Hello everybody. I am so excited to be going live with Beth over at Soulify Wellness today and we are going to be chatting about communication mistakes in relationships and how to avoid some of these. So I will get Beth up here shortly. I am so excited um, to have this chat today and let's just give her a minute. I see her joining. So um, on here with me in a few seconds. Gotta love um, <laughs> the in-between moments when we're getting everyone. Hi, there she is. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. I'm really excited for this chat today. And I figured since we're probably combining from both of our audiences, it would be a great idea to probably start off with some introductions. So do you want to go ahead and tell everybody who you are, a little bit about your background? Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. So my name is Beth Miller, and I am the founder of Solify Wellness. Sorry, Solify Wellness. So I help women, um, if you can imagine your life without feeling resentment, feeling anger, feeling sadness, feeling unappreciated. If you can imagine your life without those feelings, I help women, particularly in their marriages and motherhood, get to a place where they just feel like they're in flow in their authentic selves. I love that. Amazing. And for those who might not know me, I am Sarah Yudkin. I am a relationship anxiety coach, and I help people who are experiencing doubt in their happy, healthy relationships, um, maybe asking questions such as, um, how do I know my partner is the one? And am I settling in this relationship? I try and help people move through some of those fears and understand where they're coming from so that they can show up more confidently in their relationship as well. So I know today that we wanted to chat through some things about communication mistakes that we see happening in relationships and I feel like I just want to start off by saying communication can be so tricky and I know people you know talk about all the time like communicate 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 and we're not always taught how to do that so if we're not shown communication you know in um, from maybe our caretakers or if we're not you know modeling that from others we're not always sure how to do it so I feel like even though we're going to be giving some information you know just knowing that it, it takes some time for everyone to kind of get into this pattern and you know it gets you know, it takes practice, I mean, working with your own partner to kind of get to the place where you're feeling really confident in your communication. So I just wanted to give that caveat because I think it's hard to ever be like done learning how to communicate. It's an ongoing process. Do you feel like that's true for you? Absolutely. And I think the biggest part about communication, that word just sounds so dry sometimes, like, oh, I have to work on my communication. I'm like, what does that even mean? But essentially, it starts with you. It takes two to mingle, but really it starts with you. And the first thing that I really find that's helpful in terms of like the biggest suggestion I have um, is we just get very reactive. So we get very reactive, we get defensive and sometimes in certain situations with our communication. So if you can go inward and realize what is the emotion I'm feeling right now within this relationship, within this communication, um, in, within this conversation. So figure out what that emotion is. If it's a heated conversation, then what am I feeling? I'm feeling angry, irritated, frustrated. So that's the first thing I always start with is start with yourself and start with the emotion you're feeling. What about you, Sarah? What's one of your first strategies or first things that you suggest with some of these struggles? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I think sometimes hard to know what you're even feeling and a great resource that I found for that is using the feelings wheel um, over at feelingswheel.com and it's like a great um, visual that shows you a bunch of different feelings because I know sometimes um, you know we can just say I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling upset but what's like underneath that why are you feeling that way and how can you help your partner help you or help yourself help like understand what you're actually feeling to better communicate it. So I love that point. Uh, for me, you know, one thing I think we had talked about wanting to share with people is, is not bottling things up when you're in a partnership or even in a friendship or, you know, in any relationship, it could be with your family. If there's something you're feeling, um, your partner won't know unless you tell them. And so I think there's a, this, you know, there's this myth that our partner should just be able to read our mind or they should just be able to see that we're upset and understand why we're upset. And I used to be the queen of passive aggressive communication. Um, and I realize now that that's not something that we can really expect of people, because if you don't know exactly what others are thinking all the time, then how are you are other people supposed to know what you're thinking all the time? So it's really about like, 
I think for me, it's, it's one of the biggest lessons I've learned is like really just being able to communicate how I'm feeling to my partner by saying like, I'm upset right now. Like, do you have a few minutes to talk or like trying to, you know, gather my own thoughts, like maybe write them down and then bring them to my boyfriend, Nate, because I think that just bottling it up is going to only really hurt you. And then it will cause you to be acting in a way that's not um, in your best self, so to speak. Oh, I have so much to say to that. Essentially, when we bottle things up, we're holding them hostage in our mind. They may be fine and living their day out, but if it's a disagreement you had in the morning and it stews and stays with you all day long, you're holding them hostage. You're holding that energy, those emotions within you when really it doesn't have to be that way. I find that in the sometimes we play victim mode. Sometimes we play like if only they would change or if only they would talk to me this way, then that kind of keeps us in that loop of bad communication or poor communication or stewing on things. Um, so if we can get rid of that victim mode and the way to really do that, get rid of that like big mistake is being in victim mode is to really start to identify those emotions that you just said. And if you can own them and come from an empowered place, like I'm feeling this right now and this is what I'm bringing to the communication table. I am half of this problem this this thing that's happening within our communication and i know i can work on me and when you can work on yourself and come from an authentic place and we can talk about that in a little bit too how to authentically show up in a conversation even though you're feeling angry how do you still show up so you keep your power in that conversation yeah yeah, I love that. And we got a great question that I think perfectly ties in. And we're gonna, we might answer a few questions throughout this time, only really uh, focusing on communication, though, within relationships, another day, maybe a different topic. But um, what are your thoughts on the best way to initiate a conversation when something is bothering you? Mm -hmm. For me, I always say we got to harness that authentic you. When you, have you ever been in an argument or discussion where you're like, you leave feeling worse than you thought? Because you may have said things or got heated and you're like, I wish that hadn't happened. I wish, like, how did it spiral out of control? Um, so if you can come into it and come into it in this graceful place. So if you need to take some space away, just breathe, get yourself into a calm place, come from it from this beautiful place where you can slowly articulate your words. Maybe you even have to write things down ahead of time and maybe you have to write a letter, but have your thoughts together before and you harness this beautiful place within you. Have you ever been in a place where you're just, you feel like nothing can knock you down. Nothing can stop you. You just feel so confident. And that's how you want to approach these conversations from such a place of love and grace and confidence. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And I think to also add like another, um, like tactical approach as far as like the the words you can use to getting the conversation started for me there's been a couple of disarming phrases that I have found helpful one of them is Brene Brown's when she says the story I'm making up is dot 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 um, I think that's a really disarming phrase because it, it tells your partner that this is kind of how you're seeing the situation and it's not necessarily the truth and you'd like to hear their perspective um, I also think a great phrase to get a conversation started is like hey, I have um, something on my mind is now a good time for me to share this with you because I think mm -hmm. sometimes um, a disagreement can start because it's not necessarily at a time when the other person is able to receive that information. Um, maybe they just had a really stressful day at work as well and the, the timing of the conversation maybe caught them in a defensive place instead of an open place ready to listen. And so I know that sometimes there's never the perfect time to have a chat, but making sure that the other person is at least able to hold that energetic space for you, because I know that there's been times where me and Nate have had a disagreement. It was just because we were both like really hungry or, you know, exhausted from that day. And if we had just had it maybe the next morning, it wouldn't have been such a big deal. Oh, that's so such a good point. When we are emotionally, physically exhausted, those are not good times to start those conversations because we, when we're physically exhausted, we can't emotionally cope. Think about this. Like if you're crying and tired and all of a sudden you had to go listen to like a history lesson, how much of that information would you retain? If you're listening to a history lesson when you're just like, you're so, you're crying, you're tired versus if you're awake and alert, you'll be able to process your partner's views so much more on an even grounded level. So consider it that, like that example, like we don't bring in and retain as much information from our external, from words, if we're tired. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so far for those who are just joining, we've kind of covered that, you know, when you're bottling things up, um, that's not helping you and your relationship when you're communicating. We've also talked about, we've kind of dipped into how it's really important to uh, get a grasp, grasp, sorry, on what you are feeling so that you can help them understand what you're feeling, whether that's angry or um, upset or frustrated, like what is the emotion that's getting rustled up within you in the discussion so you can kind of communicate that way. And then we just kind of touched on the important as well. So Beth, I know you wanted to talk about bringing your most authentic self into the conversation. So can you help elaborate on how people can maybe reflect on that? Or um, what are some things that can get them thinking about how they actually really want to show up and, and how they can speak in a way that feels true to them and not just what they think they should be doing? Yeah, I say we need to practice, we should practice our authentic self every day. And just getting in touch with that person because a lot of times i know like i'm a busy mom we get to be busy wives and as we become wives a lot of times in a relationship or like within our relationship we sometimes lose part of our identity a little bit we kind of merge and become one and we adapt to each other's moods so sometimes we get kind of steered away from who we really were um, in our younger 20s um, or even earlier so what happens is if we can kind of reconnect with a time in our life where you just felt like you're on top of the world um, you felt invincible, you felt so good about yourself. And if you've never had this in your life, then you can always kind of create that persona for yourself. Of, this is what I'd like to have. And you almost, I, I teach the women I work with, we kind of channel that, we get that inward, and we feel it in our heart. You just almost feel this buzz to your body. And so when you can start to find that version of yourself that maybe we've been disconnected to from so long, like for so long, because we're in a relationship that's maybe causing us to act a certain way because we're angry and resentful and unappreciated. If we can steer ourselves back and start with that foundation of really bringing in your authentic self. Otherwise, it's hard to, to it's hard to use words when you don't feel that way. What about you, Sarah? Mm. Yeah, and I think you know a lot of people that I work with or in my audience sometimes don't even know what their authentic self is because they've gotten like disconnected from that maybe through either past experiences or, you know, the outside world kind of giving us so much information. So I think a simple way for me is like to ask like, what do I think here versus what I've heard or what I think I should be doing? Like what actually would feel good for me in this moment? So is it asking for a break in the conversation? Is it just saying like, I'm feeling really, you know, vulnerable right now. Like I don't know how to start this conversation. Like not necessarily um, always showing up in this like perfect way, but just really being vulnerable and being, um, you know, I guess the word authentic to me means like how would, the the honest version of yourself show up here like you don't have to have it all together in the conversation you can just kind of be direct and try and use the best phrases and words possible to help get your point across and that kind of leads to uh, part of being authentic I think is another part of the question that was just um, sent through is like how to tell when something is just a small thing to let go versus something that could snowball and you should bring up now and if it's okay I'd love to kind of share something that I've heard before. Um, and there's a phrase that um, I've heard before, and it's called don't let the dust settle. So if something is happening once or twice, maybe you let it go. Um, those are like small specks of dust. And they're, you know, kind of, you know, layering on the bookshelf and one or two specks of dust, no big deal. But when there's a layer of dust covering the bookshelf, that's because there's been small things building up over time. And so to me, if something is a small thing now, it might not be a small thing if it keeps coming up and you want to keep talking about it. So my theory is it's always better just to kind of have like a, a small casual conversation about something. Maybe it's not a big deal and you can even make light of it. Like, oh, like I noticed the dishes were in the sink again. Like, is, do you got, like, is there a, maybe a conversation we should have about how to split up um, the chores? Like, is there anything on your end you want to discuss here? Um, you know, that can be kind of just a casual thing. But if it's something that you have been not saying for months and months, then it's going to eventually come out in the form of frustration or anger. So I think that the small things end up snowballing sometimes into being a bigger thing. And my new perspective is it's always better to just get it out versus keeping it bottled up. So what are your thoughts on that, Beth? I think we have to look, I like to, sorry, first, I love what you said. That dust analogy is incredible. Um, it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, just to add to that, I think when we can look at what that small thing is, so what is that small thing? Is it something that 
if we want to bring in that authentic you again, is it something that really matters to you at your core? Um, or is it something that maybe you're almost holding like resentment towards or you want to nitpick or you want to like show you're better than like just say they left their laundry on the floor again your partner um is it something that you just want to nag him about that little thing on the floor or that you're trying to prove like see you don't clean up your laundry um so I think we need to figure out what the reason is that you want to bring that little thing up um because we want to make sure all our conversations come from a place of love like we're really we're on the same team. I always say to my husband, we're on the same team. We're not trying to like bully each other. or We're not trying to like hurt each other. We love each other and we do this together. Um, and understanding well, who is their authentic self in all this. Um, so if they are leaving laundry on the floor, their authentic self, do they care to really have a clean, tidy house or is putting their laundry on the floor just something that works for them? Um, so I think we really got to look at who they are authentically, who we are authentically, and where this conversation is going to come from, whether it's a place that's really positive, uplifting, loving, or if it's a place of low vibe energy that may go sideways if we bring that up in that kind of direction of nagging or resentment or anger. Yeah, and I think there's like a little bit of lag maybe on my side or yours. I don't know. Um, but I'm just, whenever I'm pausing, it's because I'm waiting to <laughs> have it catch up on the live. But I think that's so true. Like, why am I bringing this up right now? That's a, that's a huge piece. And I think, I mean, the, the goal would be to get to a place in the relationship where like you can kind of, you know, have conversations without every single discussion being this big to do. And one thing that I've heard many um, couples talk about is having like a relationship check in meeting, you know, weekly or bi weekly, and um, kind of just talking about some things that are going well, some things that maybe each other would like to see more of. Um, so you can kind of, you know, decide if that's something that feels good for you. But I, I do think that, at least with me and Nate now, like after five years, and I know that's not even that um, long compared to some relationships, but it's definitely my longest relationship. And after five years, like, I don't feel as worried bringing up something in a conversation. And it doesn't have to be this sit down uh, discussion, it can just be like, hey, like, I noticed this is that was that your intention? Or, you know, here's how I noticed something like, can we discuss and usually it can be a little bit less meaningful. But if there is something really, really important that I want to talk about, then I make sure to give it the time and attention and make sure he's in a good place to receive that message and that we can actually like have a thorough discussion on it. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you something else. So one of the mistakes that I see within the women I work, and I don't like to use the word mistake, but something that I see as a pattern is a lot of women when their, or their husband is almost like challenging a thought or not agreeing with them, they almost feel like they're not loved. They take their language and what their partner is saying to them is not being loving so just say there's dishes in the sink and they ask their partner you know what can you help with the dishes but the partner kind of dismisses it and lies on the couch they take that as their partner not loving them what do you what are your thoughts on this kind of behavior and is it really that the spouse doesn't love them yeah I I don't think that's the case um John Gottman has a really great quote about this he says like most um actions are done out of mindlessness and not malice I don't know if you've heard that one before, but I think that's such a good one just to say that, you know, when you accidentally don't do something for your partner, or if you say the wrong thing, you know, you're usually not doing it to be spiteful. And even if you're in like a fear-based mentality and say something you don't mean, usually you can realize like, Ooh, I didn't mean that. Um, and I think that's the same thing with like the dishes in the sink or the trash not getting taken out. You know, it's not that they're doing something to spite you or because they don't care. It's typically, in my opinion, a result of, you know, there's just, a lot happening and and I think that it can be looked at as the relationship's not a priority as well and I see that perspective um I do but I think just realizing that we're all just like doing our best hopefully and if that person's character is usually to be supportive and usually to help out um because hopefully that is otherwise you know why be in that relationship um I think then you can you can just decide for yourself like okay like if I'm noticing this pattern maybe I can I can say something but if it's looking out for every single time there's like a towel in the wrong place or like on the ground then like as you said earlier what's my intention am I just trying to like catch my partner in the act of doing something um wrong or am I like genuinely trying to help and like make our relationship stronger mm -hmm. I love what you said we're doing the best we can so I say that all the time I think that's a powerful quote there 
Our partners are doing the best they can with what they have. And when I say what they have, it's the tools that they have in regards to communication. How were they brought up in regards to communication? What, what was modeled in their house was, um, was it modeled that you just kind of bottle everything up, you just push it down and you keep going and you don't have tough conversations? Or was it very loud and explosive within their home? Um, so I think it's really important to look at your partner and see they're doing the best they can with what they have. And we can work on this together, right? Um, if they're open to it, if they're not terribly open to it, then there's some strategies that we could use. And what would you suggest if your partner's not really open to improving their communication? Hmm. Yeah, that's, it's a tough one because I do think that communication is absolutely something that can be worked on. And I, I never believe that like, one habit or pattern or behavior in a relationship is always going to stay the same. You know, we hopefully are growing and evolving with our partner in the course of the relationship. But I think, you know, being curious is a really good place to start instead of like labeling your partner as like, he won't have this conversation or they won't have this conversation. It's not gendered here. Right. So they won't have this conversation or, you know, they never communicate and, and kind of like leaving it at that. I think it's important to ask some questions and like try to understand your partner better like how did communication happen in your household growing up and like really learn about them and eight dates is a great book for this by the Gottman Institute um, there's eight different dates about like questions with different subjects like family work you know even how to argue like things like that um, so that was a great conversation starter between me and Nate and I think getting curious and asking those questions is such a better place to come from than assumptions or judgments even. What about you, Beth? What do you think? I, you nailed it. I think that's exactly the way I think too, that um, we really got to start where our partner is at and figuring out what that place is. And um, yeah, you just got to know where they're at. I can give you so many examples, but really just meeting them where they're at and knowing that they're doing the best they can kind of that like looping right back in little steps. Um, Picking the time, like we mentioned earlier, the time that you talk to them based on their mood, they're exhausted, maybe even booking that conversation, say this is something that's really important. Um, can we talk about this tomorrow if that's better? So um, depending on the situation, feel it out with love and feel it out with, like you said, curiosity. Um, the next yeah. thing I thought I would bring up in regards to mistakes, which I don't like that word, but mistakes are looping arguments. So who has not been in a relationship where you feel like you could put the record on in the same conversation is happening again? It might be about something totally different. This time it might be about um, a task, like maybe you're fixing up, you're tidying the garage and that task has not been done and you're asking them to do that. Or last week it might have been, um, there was, I'm just trying to think, like you didn't help with dinner, but it seems to always spin back to the exact same thing. What are your thoughts on that? Because there's got to be a way to get off this hamster wheel of looping patterns of communication. Yeah, I think this ties a couple of things that we were sharing earlier, which is getting down to like the core frustration or the core reason why the conversation is happening. Cause it's really not about the garage being messy, right? It's about, Oh, my partner doesn't take accountability or, you know, my partner's not consistent or whatever, whatever the frustration is there. It's usually way below the surface. So do I even love my partner is actually a fear of like failure or, you know, a fear of, um, abandonment. It's really not just like the, the thought on the surface. So I think that's, you know, that's like what I try and teach in my work anyway, is like trying to really understand like, why am I feeling this? So you, you brought that point up earlier. So I think if you find yourself in the same conversation, I think it may be that you're getting stuck on the surface of like the chore that hasn't been done or, you know, whatever the disagreement is where you need to be going maybe one to two steps deeper. I was like, well, why does this bother me? And then, oh, well, why does that bother me? And what is that telling me about what I think about my relationship or my partner? And so I think it's continuing to ask why of yourself and of your partner until you really get to the bottom of um, the, the initial frustration or fear that's happening. Mm -hmm. The why game is a powerful game. And that's a great way to take back your kind of feeling more empowered in that conversation. So for example, um, I work with women. So I apologize that a lot of my examples are with women. But if, um, for example, if your husband sleeps in all the time, and you just get so angry, I'm like, I have to work with the kids every morning to get their breakfast, and to get them dressed, and you're upset, you're frustrated that your husband's sleeping in, you ask yourself why? The first level would be why, because I don't want to do all this work by myself. And then you ask yourself why, 
Why do I not want to do all that work? Because I, I want to do it together with him. And then you ask yourself why I want to do it together because to me, that's what love is. Um, and then you get into that next level. Like why is love working together? And you know what? It comes down to as a child, I saw maybe my mom do so much work on her own and my dad was busy working that maybe I'm fearful of having that relationship become my relationship where I'm scared that I'm going to end up doing all this on my own. So it spins back to if I just keep nagging him, maybe that won't be the case. He'll eventually come and help me. So the why is so powerful. If you can go down almost like five layers of why you want this, why you want this, and why that's your truth, we can really get below the surface of that argument of him sleeping in, me feeling resentful and unappreciated, or taking care of the kids. Yes, exactly. And that's so true. Like imagine saying, hey, X, Y, Z, like, hey, partner's name. I saw my parents like all the time growing up and I didn't get that. Like I, I didn't see my mom getting the help she needed and it made me really upset. And I'm worried that that's like what's going to happen to us. Like, can we discuss this? That is such a more productive conversation than, oh, no, you're sleeping in again. Like that immediately gets the partner on defensive mode. It's not actually saying authentically what you're actually mad about or frustrated with and then no one is making progress because you're sticking to the surface level you're sleeping in versus the deeper fear or frustration is that I don't want to end up in a marriage where things are like not 50 50 or like close to that um, where we're not working together as a team and where we're driven apart because of you know the household chores or whatever it is and so I think just being authentic in that word of like, what am I really afraid of? Or what am I really frustrated by that can help your partner have more empathy for you. And then usually if you can actually be vulnerable and share why you're frustrated, then they want to jump in and help more instead of just the nagging that typically happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just saw a great question come through. Is it ever better to have the conversation over text? Well, we could probably have a really good debate on this one, but I think it comes down to your communication style. Um, some people have a lot of difficulties finding their words. So going into a difficult conversation, I always suggest whether for me, I have to sometimes write out some of my points because I can get um, hung up on certain, I don't know what to think or I get overwhelmed, um, especially if I'm not 100% rested. So text is great because it's another form of communication in terms of written. Um, so I think, I think text there definitely is a place for a text conversation because it can take some of the emotion out because you're not seeing your partner face to face and you're not actually seeing the anger or sensing the anger. Um, we just got to make sure that the words are coming through with that place of love and not, if you're feeling triggered through anything that they're saying, you want to clarify. Um, if they were to say, just say, oh, I'm trying to think of a really good example recently, but oh, I left the windows down in the van. It started to rain. My husband's like, you left the windows open again. You should be putting the windows up as soon as you put the car in the driveway, you shouldn't be letting the windows stay down. And all of a sudden I get upset because I made a mistake. I, um, and then we could talk about that later through text. And I just have to watch the words that I'm using and make sure I'm using my I statements and I'm not accusatory of being accusatory of him in that conversation of in owning it. You're right. It's not a great decision. I can understand why you're concerned. The car might get destroyed if it starts to rain. The leather seats will be wrecked. I was trying to just air up the car so it wasn't super hot, but I understand your perspective. Um, instead of me taking it offensively, being like, he's attacking me because I made a mistake. I left the windows down. He's trying to control me. So um, no matter what you're doing, texting or talking, I think as long as it's coming from that place of love, being curious and setting your boundaries. Yeah, I love that. And I think the only thing that concerns me sometimes about text is like, we can become like keyboard warriors sometimes these days, like, it's easy to just like be reactive and like say something. Um, and, and that happens in person too. So I think it's just knowing yourself and like knowing how you best respond. But if you're texting, like you really have to work extra to be descriptive and say, well, this is how I'm feeling about this. Because when you're in person, you can kind of sense like someone's frustrated or like they're thinking or whatever. But when you're via text, and I got many years of experience with this because me and Nate did two and a half, three years of long distance. So like, I know that you can't always have that conversation in person, but I think it's, it's really either working via text to like over communicate in the sense of like making sure it's very clear what you're feeling or at least, um, as you said, getting those bullet points and then deciding, okay, well, maybe it's better than we finish this conversation over a call or via a FaceTime or in person so that you at least 
are planning to have that that second piece. So I think that's a great question. And if anyone else has a communication related question, I feel like we have maybe about five more minutes of time. So um, um, for those joining, like we kind of talked about a lot of things that um, you can improve your communication on and it's making sure that you know how you're feeling. It's making sure that you are gathering your thoughts together and coming into the conversation. It's making sure that you're not letting the dust settle by um, letting things go and kind of bottling them up. So that's kind of what we've been discussing. And um, Beth, if there's anything else you want to say as far as like making sure that people have some tips, feel free to send those and we'll take maybe one or two more questions in the next few minutes. Sure. I think we've really laid it out. Um, you're identifying your emotions, so you're knowing when you're triggered. Um, and you really have to come from the perspective that they are in a place of love. I'm in a place of love. Like, they are not attacking me. We are on the same team. So when yeah. we can just start every conversation with that, like, we're on the same team. They're not trying to hurt me because we take things so offensively sometimes. And then if you are taking things offensively, we got to get to that bottom layer um, by playing the why game. Why do I feel like he's trying to attack me and go from there? Yeah, great. Well, we saw, okay, I saw two questions come through. So let's cap it at that. Um, and we'll answer these two and then we will wrap up. So the first one was, I have communicated my wants and needs explicitly, but my boyfriend continues not to act on them. How much is too much when it comes to stating your needs and wants? So I'll let you take that one first and I'll add anything if I think I have more thoughts. Okay, so he continues to not act on them. So I would love to know what the example is, but just as a general, I wonder why he's not acting on them. Is it something like, if we kind of, I keep bringing back our authentic self, but is there something that he's like, it doesn't serve me. It's not how I operate. It's not my operating mode. Um, so if you're asking him to, I, I don't want to bring back the dishes, but just something like take out the trash. Is that something that he just doesn't want to do? It doesn't something he values. Um, and of course, we can recognize that, yeah, that's not something you value, but as a team, can we make some compromises here? Um, and asking them, what do you want? Just throwing that question back, like, this isn't working for me. What is it that you want? How do you see us navigating this situation together? Um, instead of us almost like maybe sometimes just, just telling them what we want, but we can also ask them, what do they want? Yes, I was going to say like having a discussion versus like making requests. Know, mandatory thing. So I think coming to an agreement together. And if you found that you have, if he has agreed, but then isn't acting on it, then, you know, just saying, okay, well, we've had this discussion, you agreed, and you're not acting on it. So like, let's reconvene. And if it's not something that you can come to an agreement together, I think that's the point where you ask yourself, like you can ask yourself, how much is too much, because we can't give you that answer. Um, unfortunately, like there's no one that can tell you but you about what is serving or not serving you in your relationship, but you can reflect like, okay, how much is too much? Like, what am I or not willing to put up with? Um, and for how long? And then once you get really honest with yourself about that, um, you can, you know, either communicate it directly, or you can just have that in your own mind and, and just say like, hey, this isn't going to work for me um, if we can't make changes. And so how can we discuss together? is like coming to the conclusion as a unit versus one person having the idea. That's a great advice. All right, let's go to our last question. What happens when your boyfriend comments on your weight and says that they're not attracted to you completely because of your weight? Oh, geez, this is a tough one. How would you navigate this one? Yeah, so for me, this is all about boundaries. Like, I think that you have to explicitly state like, I am not okay with you making comments about my appearance that are negative um, and like my weight and my, you know, what looks are not up for discussion. Like this is my body. It makes me feel really uncomfortable. Um, and I think you have to be very explicit with that because unfortunately, like, I mean, I'm sorry, but that's pretty messed up in my opinion, but not everyone thinks that is. So, um, you know, I think that you just have to be really clear. Like if this is making you uncomfortable, set that boundary. And if it's something that your partner can't meet, and they continue saying that, like you, I think you need to just ask yourself, like, do I want to be in a relationship with someone that's disrespecting my looks? Because, you know, for me, that would just be like a complete no. Um, but other people, of course, like have different levels that they're willing to, you know, accept. So I think for me, that's all about boundaries. What are your thoughts, Beth? I think I agree with everything you said. And I would actually just take it one step further and be like, 
yes, okay, it's not right what he did. I agree with that. But I believe what he's saying is true. So is there any level of you that actually agrees mm. that I'm not attractive? Um, so I think if we take it in inwardly as well, because he could be mirroring to us, kind of projecting to us some of our own insecurities um, and finding out what aspects of yourself do you not find attractive? What do you not love about your body? Um, and really maybe working on some self-love and we could talk about that maybe on another another live but self-love in, yeah. in regards to your relationship yeah and we, we just got some more context he said it once and I keep hanging it over his head so I think that um as much as like yes I don't love that behavior I do think like if he has made amends or like is apologizing and like ha won't do it again like the past in some ways is the past, but everyone has a different level of tolerance. So for example, like, you know, certain types of like emotional or verbal or physical abuse, like one and done can be like, that's it for people. But if it was one comment and you are able to have a discussion with him and, and he is able to say that wasn't what I intended, like, I'm so sorry, I hurt you. And you're able to find a way to move past it. I think that it, it's just different for everyone. So I, I never like to give advice about like, this is a deal breaker or not, because everyone's level is different. And um, I do think that there's ways to move past those types of comments, but you have to be willing to um, do that on your end too. So I think, yeah, it, it's hard to get like super specific into relationships, if you don't know the full story. But I think generally, um, that's what I would say, and just kind of use all the tools that we were talking about in this live. And like, really share from your most authentic self and even if you're still holding it over his head you can say like I find myself myself still holding this comment over your head like can we just talk about it together and then maybe like bury it once and for all yeah I would dig into I like I always want to dig into everything because there's such a subconscious reason why are you hanging on to it I would say is it because you don't trust that he actually thinks you're attractive anymore and so then when we look into this hanging over your head, is it that I don't trust that he actually thinks I'm attractive? Um, we've got to decide, are those feelings coming from something that's actually valid in that moment that he doesn't find you attractive? Or is it something from your past that's playing and kind of creating that narrative, that story for right now? Um, so that hanging over your head, I'd love to know, you don't have to share that right now, but it, it, ask yourself, why am I hanging on to this? Why am I holding on to this? Why do I keep maybe throwing it back in his face? So um, I always say, is it our past that's influencing our current feelings? And if so, we need to deal with our past and why we don't feel beautiful or why we don't trust our partner or why maybe we were treated in a previous relationship where we didn't feel like we were attractive and maybe that those feelings are seeping back in and we need to process some of those and do some healing from our past. Yes, I could not agree more. And I feel like we could absolutely do a part two on even still communication because it's such a ongoing subject. So I'd love to do it again. Maybe on your um, Instagram, we can you can host and we can get another conversation going sometime in the next couple months. So thank you so much, Beth. This was great. And um, where can people kind of find you or like how do you work with people? Is there anything you want to share on your end for people to connect with you? Absolutely. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook at Solify Wellness. I have this great guide for those that are married, but even if you're not married, it has some incredible three ways to save your relationship, three ways to save your marriage. Um, so go to www.freemarriageguide.com and you can pick up those three incredible tips. Awesome. And then just quickly on my end, I am over at you love and you learn on Instagram. And there is a link in my bio with a free training as well. Um, it's kind of like the most important lesson I have learned from healing my anxiety in my relationship. Um, and so go check that out over on my page. And thank you so much to everyone that joined. This was such a great conversation. And we'll definitely have to do it again. Wonderful. Thanks, Sarah. Bye, everyone. Bye.